He could have been killed. Oh, never mind. He's all right. So, the 21-22 football season is over. It's been a great year. Lots of excitement, lots of highs, lots of lows, and a surprising lack of dabs. Just like last year, today we'll be recapping the most recent football season for the top 5 leagues in Europe as per UEFA coefficients. Uh, surprise, surprise, it's England, Spain, Germany, Italy, and France. Shocking, I know. We're going to head over to Germany and kick this one off all the way down in 11th place. After achieving their best finish in the Bundesliga since 1994 last year, Eintracht Frankfurt failed to carry their momentum through to this campaign. An early exit from the DFB Pokal rounded up a disappointing domestic run, meaning no European football next year. But the boys over at Frankfurt hatched up a genius idea. If we want European football next year, why not just win the Europa League? Is what I imagine they said. I wasn't actually there. Uh, but they did it. Real Betis, Barcelona, West Ham and finally Rangers on penalties, their only piece of European silverware since last winning the same trophy all the way back in 1980. Shout out to Kevin Trapp who was insane in the final, deservedly man of the match. Also, let the record show that in the oil era, Kevin Trapp has won European silverware before PSG. RB Leipzig won the DFB Pokal. The club was formed in 2009 through some pretty egregious loopholes and went on to win major silverware in the year they turned 13. An incredible achievement for them, but a frustrating and worrying victory for most of Germany. I've covered their controversial rise in more detail in this video, so I won't get into it here. But what I will say is that, unfortunately for many, it's a pretty safe bet to assume that they will only get bigger and bigger as time goes by. Bayern Munich dominated the league once again with this season making it 10 wins in a row. Unbelievable. Lewandowski was balling out of control, as usual, Bundesliga top scorer for the fifth time in a row. Thomas Müller was screaming his lungs out while also balling out of control, Bundesliga top assist provider for the third year in a row. It really was just business as usual, wasn't it? The competition just cannot touch them. Second place Borussia Dortmund put up a decent fight. Uh, I mean, the 8 point gap they left at the top is at least an improvement on the 13 point gap Leipzig left last year. And who knows, with Lewandowski basically trying to force a move, perhaps they can push on and mount more of a challenge next year. Although that will be easier said than done, especially considering the fact that they've just been forced to sell their 21 year old top goal scorer, Erling Haaland. But at least there are some positives to this deal. I'm sure there are a, a couple Bundesliga fans that will be happy to see the back of him. So at this point, you may be asking, where is young Erling going? Surely a team that absolutely needs him, right? Manchester City, the Premier League overlords, have done it once again. Things were looking a little shaky towards the end, but was there ever any doubt? This is their fourth title in five years. Guardiola has been there for six. Did I hear someone say Farmers League? This team has lacked a fit, true number 9 for about two seasons now, something that would be a massive crutch for just about every other team in Europe. But when you have a team and manager this strong, the outcome basically becomes a foregone conclusion almost every time. Not in the Champions League though. The semi-final exit to Madrid left every City fan feeling a little bit like Sergio Aguero. La pico. And with Nottingham Forest back in the Premier League next year, every English European Cup winner will once again be in the top flight. Meaning, just like they did against Arsenal earlier in January in the FA Cup, City can expect yet another team to chant Champions of Europe, you'll never sing that. Forest will of course be singing this as City batters them 6-0. But still, that is tough. Speaking about Arsenal, yet again, they've shown signs of improvement. But, yet again, they have shown that the concept of consistency is a foreign one. The team and the fans really have been going through it this year, haven't they? The highs of Arteta ball finally starting to kick into gear and the lows of a spectacular mental collapse at the run-in. They even had small YouTuber KSI really going through it after missing out on top four. I can't believe this. Oh! I can't do this anymore, man! 
But Arsenal really shouldn't feel too bad. Them, Spurs, Man United and massive West Ham were playing hot potato with fourth place for what seemed to be weeks on end. David Moyes really did do a stellar job this year and was only two points away from causing a proper meltdown over at his former employers. However, it was Spurs who deservingly came out on top in that race. Apparently, bringing in a world-renowned manager known for winning in the short term was all it took to whip them into shape. This time. And while we're on the subject, how's Harry Kane ended up with 17 goals this year despite taking a vacation for the first 15 games or so? Couple that with a man that won the golden boot with no penalties and I guess what you have is a Champions League spot. Elsewhere in London and Chelsea got off to a strong start, but eventually just couldn't keep up with the top two. A decent season by most accounts. FIFA Club World Cup winners and third place in the league is pretty good, especially considering the fact that they weren't always firing on all cylinders. And especially considering the fact that Romelu Lukaku made a sensational return with the promise of solving their striker problem only for him to kiss the badge, badmouth the manager, apologize for badmouthing the manager, and end the season off with 8 goals in 26 appearances and a handful of injuries. Not the greatest of returns for a 98 million pound transfer, I must say. But if we're going to speak about disappointing returns, oh man, I can't be asked with this team. A second place finish last year with a buzz around the club. Oli was at the wheel. Cristiano Ronaldo made his way back. Rafael Varane followed. Jadon Sancho was finally secured. For the first time since 2013, United fans had hope. And then... Nothing. That team's got nothing. Keep They're broken. The players or the They're good broken. Lads. They're broken. Harry Maguire! And this Damn, and delete the club at this point. So much is wrong. Their worst points tally in Premier League history, Glazers still taking dividends out despite increasing debt and losses, players not even trying more often than not. Rolf Rangnick coming through for a six-month caretaker role with the promise of a two-year consultancy, only for that entire arrangement to be scrapped. Like, wh what was even the point of this? Eric Ten Hag. Good luck, my man. Although, I will say this, it could have been much worse for Man United. They could have been in a relegation battle with Everton. Crazy how this team almost went down. Only 4 points between them and a Sean Deitchless Burnley really is scary stuff. But all of this left me pretty confused. It seems as though all of these teams missed the memo. The true secret to surviving a relegation battle is winning once in your first 18 games, becoming the richest club in the world and having a miraculous second half of the season. I call this one the Saudi Special. This is Newcastle at match week 19, one point from the bottom at the midway point. Fast forward to May 2022 and if the Premier League started in January 2022, this is how it would look. Yes, you are reading that correctly. This is absurd. Mad props to Eddie Howe and the boys, and I rate they're only getting started. Going away from relegation and lasering in on a team that experienced a completely different kind of disappointment this year, we turn to Liverpool. People are making memes about the fact that they set out for the quadruple only to end up with a domestic double, but this team and what they've accomplished is pretty incredible. Chelsea know this all too well losers to the Reds in both the FA Cup Final and the League Cup Final. They embarrassed Man United 9-0 on aggregate and played in every single match available to them this year. Think about how crazy that is. Every single match. 63 in total. It dawned on me while writing this that the majority of this team's backbone are fast approaching their career backends and some will likely leave in the coming weeks. So while Jurgen Klopp's extension essentially means that Liverpool will continue their success, this particular squad will be moving on. In 20 years time, when people look back at what this specific group achieved and what trophies they missed out on, without the context of how good the teams they faced were, I fear they will not be given the props they deserve. Which is a shame, but it's the nature of the game. To be the best, you have to beat the best. And speaking of the best, I'm sure the white side of Madrid was smiling when they saw Mohamed Salah tweet this out. Sergio Ramos may not have been on the pitch when Madrid beat Liverpool in yet another Champions League final, but his spirit lived on in the hearts of all those in white that day. The start of the season saw Ramos leave Madrid, which must have been tough to watch for many. But with the likes of David Alaba coming through for free and Eduardo Camavinga choosing Madrid over many suitors, the future was looking bright. 
and Don Carlo Ancelotti return to the Bernabeu, replacing the outgoing Zidane. After a stint at Everton with fairly average results, people were claiming he was past it, to which he simply replied with, Real Madrid are just inevitable, man. They won the league, which is a massive win on its own, but in Europe, they are quite literally the manifestation of destiny. How many times did it look like they were legitimately down and out just for them to play the old Uno reverse card? Crazy. Karim Benzema has the Ballon d'Or in the bag at this point, right? Seeing as it's now based on the season and not the calendar year, nothing else can sway opinions. So France football, all the voting journalists, you haven't disappointed me before, so I'll leave this one with you. Also, Luka Modric's cross to Rodrigo in the semi-finals against Chelsea needs to be hung up in the Louvre. It was a chef's kiss. Moving along, we witnessed a very rare moment in football as Real Madrid, the league winners, hosted Real Betis, the Copa del Rey winners, on the final match day of the season. The reason this was rare is because we got back-to-back -back God of Honours. That's what I like to see. Respect. 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 Respect, man. Respect. Under Manuel Pellegrini, fifth place Betis won their first piece of major silverware since they last won the same award back in 2005. 40 year old captain Joaquin was in the starting 11 last time they won. This time, he came on in the 86th minute and ended up slotting in his penalty in the shootout. Legend. And while we're on the topic of throwbacks, here's a photo of Juan Miranda, a left back over at Betis, watching on as Joaquin and the boys last won it. Here's a snapshot of him slotting in the winning penalty 17 years later. You love to see it. Atletico Madrid, the reigning La Liga champions, unfortunately failed to replicate their heroics from the previous season, falling to third while their city rivals blazed on to victory. And it's safe to say the Atletico faithful weren't too happy with Thibaut Courtois' success across town as they ripped his plaque off their commemorative walk of fame. To be fair, all you have to do to get a plaque is play 100 games for Atleti, which isn't that much when you think about it. Courtois was only there for three seasons. And he was never actually an Atletico player, rather a Chelsea low knee throughout the entirety of his time there. Tough. But I doubt Courtois is too bothered. The return of Antoine Griezmann from Barcelona wasn't enough to propel Atletico forward, and Griezmann must have been pretty relieved to go back then. Barca was a bit of a dumpster fire at the start of the year. Okay, uh, a tad more than a bit. Ronald Koeman simply was not up to the task at hand, and by the time he was axed in early November, Blaugrana was sitting in 9th place after 13 games played. Yikes. But you can always count on Xavi for an assist. The transformation was real. 2nd place when it was all said and done. And they even got Usman Dembele to ball out and become the highest La Liga assist provider of the year. It's about time. Having said all of that, money continues to be an issue for Barca and it probably will be for a while. They need to balance their books. On the flip side, if you've ever wanted to play a game at the Camp Nou for 300 euros a head, you can. And Lord knows Barca needs the funds. On the other hand, this is a problem that their greatest player ever really doesn't have to worry about anymore. Over in Paris and the bank balances are nothing other than green. PSG assembled what many believe to be the second coming of the Avengers at the start of the year. Messi and Ramos, which is still a very odd sight to behold, as well as an array of top experienced talent. And that's not even mentioning Neymar, Kylian Mbappe and the already existing superstar roster. In the end, it all paid off. They won league in. Finally, silverware at last. That's, uh, that's, that's what all the spending was about, right? Hmm? They've, they've won this one eight times in the last 10 years. Oh, oh, they wanted the other one. Just like Betis, Nantes came up on a historic victory with their Coupe de France win after not winning anything for quite some time. Since 2001 in their case, a victory made even more meaningful thanks to the fact that they were a whisker away from relegation last season, winning the Ligue 1 relegation playoffs against Toulouse on away goals. Now, they're in the Europa League. Okay, but just going back to PSG, I really do wonder, were these men cursed? Has Nasser angered the football gods or something? Not only did they crash out of the Champions League in the round of 16, but they got fleeced by a 23-year-old Ninja Turtle. Donatello! <laughs> Kylian Mbappe is apparently now the highest paid player in the world with a weekly wage of almost 1 million pounds. Yep, 
You, you heard that right. Just imagine how many FIFA packs you could buy with that. You still wouldn't pack Kylian Mbappe though. But seriously, when are we going to just scrap FFP? We can't keep pretending like it actually means anything at this point when PSG can just hand out contracts like this. Anyway, uh, this is all so ridiculous. But you know what? Maybe, maybe we're all wrong. Maybe this wasn't just about the money and he actually likes staying in his hometown, surrounded by his friends and family, while also making bucket loads of money. Maybe now PSG actually stands a chance at winning the Champions League. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, that was, that was unprofessional. In all honesty, this team will need something miraculous to happen if they want to win a European trophy in the years to come. Something incredible. Something, uh, special. Like, perhaps, the special one. Jose Mourinho. Another year, another European trophy for the man. In the inaugural season of the Europa Conference League, and also Mourinho's inaugural season as manager, he coached Roma to European glory against Feyenoord in the finals. It wasn't pretty, but they got it done. And when the time came to run the clock down, Tammy Abraham certainly knew what needed to be done. He's a Mourinho player alright, although back home and Roma finished in 6th. A bit disappointing, but not too bad considering who finished above them. After having both of their banter eras coincide with one another, we can now truly say that the Milan banter era has come to a close. For two seasons straight, the Milan clubs have finished as the top two clubs in the country. After an 11 year wait, this time around, it was AC Milan's turn. An all round solid cohesive performance year round brought the Scudetto back to the San Siro. After it had spent so much time last year at uh, the San Siro. First as a player, now as a technical director, Paolo Maldini is just something else man. Milan fans in the comments, correct me if I'm wrong, but surely this man is the greatest Milan legend of all time. And the bloodline is strong with this one. He may have a long way to go still, but Daniel Maldini, Paolo Maldini's youngest son, became the third generation of Maldinis to lift the Serie A trophy, coming two generations after his grandfather Cesare Maldini, who won four of them. We also got to mention Zlatan Ibrahimovic, who was standing right there when Rossoneri lost won the trophy in 2011. 41 years old later in the year and he's still going. For now, at least. Following the win, he announced that he had been playing through injury for 6 months, postponing corrective surgery because it would have sidelined him beyond the season. He's since had the surgery, and from what it seems, the earliest he'll be back in firing for Milan is early 2023. That's of course if he and Milan decide to continue on together. Now I'm not going to glorify destroying your body for a sport, but this speaks volumes for his character at the very least. The guy really is a lion like he always says he is. Elsewhere, we had Juventus falling behind once more. A couple of emotional goodbyes from the likes of Paolo Dybala and Giorgio Chiellini probably didn't help ease the blow. And then we have Napoli once again challenging for the league for the majority of the season only to fall off a few short weeks before the end. I swear I've seen this happen to them so many times over the past few years. Here's what the Serie A table was looking like at match week 31. It's pretty tight. They then went ahead and lost 2 and drew 1 in their next 3 games, yeeting themselves out of the title race. You hate to see it. But at the very least, Marek Hamšík got to win his first ever league trophy with Trabzonspor over in Turkey. It's the little things that count. And there we have it. Another crazy season done, dusted and in the memory banks. It goes without saying that you can't fit an entire season's worth of notable moments, achievements and tidbits into one silly little YouTube video. So I turn to you guys. What was your favourite moment of the year? Let me know in the comments below. And if you haven't already, be sure to follow me on Twitter and Instagram but only if you want to. That is all for me today. Really hope you guys enjoyed this one as much as I enjoyed putting it together. Hope you're all staying safe. Cheers and I'll catch you in the next one.